Good morning and welcome to St. Mary Magdalene with St. Martin here in Addiscombe in East Croydon to our service of Holy Communion this first Sunday in September. And so far it's been a very beautiful September for the last four days anyway. Very sadly, um, we've had to announce the death of our beloved Gwen, often known as Dr. Gwen, Gwen Fisher, who died peacefully earlier on this week. And we will be remembering Tony and all of Gwen's family in our prayers and offer, offer him and your family our love and our support. She was um, well into her 90s and had lived a long and good life and was very popular, I know, in Addiscombe as a, a doctor and loved very much by her church family here over many years. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let's stand and sing our hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Let's stand together. Would you like to be seated as we come to pray? Let's pray together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind 
and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Therefore now let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Shall we stand to sing the Gloria together? And the collect for today. We pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you like to remain standing as we hear our Gospel reading? reading is taken from Luke 14, verses 25 to 33. The cost of discipleship. Now large crowds were travelling with him, and he turned to them and, and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, 
When he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can be my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Would you like to be seated? I don't know about you, but whenever I read those verses from verse 31, O oh, what king going out to wage a war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000, I always think of Henry V. <laughs> I don't know if you know um, Shakespeare's rendition of Henry V, that on St. Crispin's Day, Henry V, according to Shakespeare, regaled his troops, of which were in a huge minority, if you can have such a thing, (laughs) uh, against the French, regaled them with the reality of what they were about to face, certain death, um, but that they would be glorious in that death. And in fact, they won the battle. So there's something in this passage here that um, I don't know if William Shakespeare was thinking about this when he um, wrote Henry V and and used it as a play on history. Um, But the reality that we are faced must be considered in life. Today, I'm just going to look at um, something we're familiar with and for us to breathe new life into it yet again, the whole subject of our discipleship, our following of Jesus. And I'm sure many of us would agree that we live in what we might call a market-driven society. And in such a society where we are trying to sell, right, around us is so much advertising, etc., etc. we're trying to sell in order to make a living, we will try and offer the best deal. So we cut back and cut back and cut back. So you get three for the price of one or two for the price of one and a half or whatever. We try to undercut our competitors so that people will favour our product and we will make money. There is, I'm sure, in many of us, a sort of that sense within us that that's how we should offer Jesus to other people, marketing Jesus, if you like, sharing our faith. But when Christian mission is shaped towards I come first mentality, It is more often than not a low cost or a low risk commodity that we're trying to offer. How else can we persuade people to receive faith if not by coming to them with a lower or better offer than other faiths? Now, I'm sure none of us think of Christianity or our faith as clear cut in that way, but that culture does impinge upon us. What is it about Jesus that we can say that will appeal to others. In our lectionary reading, which um, Stephen has just read to us from Luke 14, 25 to 33, there's a real challenge in this to the market-driven approach to the Christian mission. The text that we've just heard begins with two discipleship sayings of Jesus, two things that Jesus says about discipleship that we can hold on to. And they require absolute allegiance to him. And then Jesus tells two brief stories or parables, if you like, to illustrate the importance of counting the cost and giving up all for Jesus. Jesus' first discipleship saying here is framed in quite blunt or stark language. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Now this saying of Jesus fits with what he's recorded as saying two chapters earlier in chapter 12, where he warns, Jesus warns people of families 
being divided over his message. He hasn't come to wreck families, but he himself, because of who he is, will divide families over his message. Jesus, in his person and message, requires those who follow him to answer the ultimate allegiance question. And therefore, it's not surprising that he may inherently bring strife to a family where one may want to believe and the other does not. Now, the language of this particular saying, the language that Jesus is using or that Luke is using to record it, does raise a few concerns, I'm sure. What is the word you think that might raise most concern in this passage? I think it's the word hate. Does Jesus really call us to hate our biological families as opposed to our spiritual families and even our very lives? Now, just a couple of things that might help us get a perspective on the use of language here. First of all, Jesus is using what's called hyperbolic language. And he does that quite frequently in his teachings. And this becomes clear when we compare Matthew's record of this account with that of Luke. It's not that they say anything di different, but they put a different perspective, slightly different perspective. So Matthew records Jesus' words in this way. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Softer language, but perhaps explaining the understanding of the word hate here. And it's interesting to think, why does Luke choose to use the word hate? I don't have an answer because I'm not Luke. But I do wonder if it causes us to think very seriously about what Jesus is saying. Matthew is drawing on the same Jesus tradition as Luke, and he's obviously interpreted the more stark language hate to refer to actually a primary allegiance. So as we have allegiance to our families, so Jesus requires our allegiance to him to be that and greater still. So our primary allegiance, Matthew is indicating through his interpretation, must be to Jesus rather than family. That still sounds hard, but it is understandable if we know that God is a God of love into whom we place our family, those whom we love, those whom are close to us. We place their lives in his hands. A second helpful observation for us may well be that the use of hate in Luke might indeed reflect an idiom that comes from the Hebrew language. In Genesis chapter 29, verses 30 and 31, which are written in Hebrew, whereas Luke and Matthew are written in Greek, we hear that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah and that Leah was hated by Jacob, this Hebrew word for hate used there. And a similar use of the Hebrew word for hate we can find in Deuteronomy, the law that was given, chapter 21, where it's also clear that the issue is one of preference or allegiance. So that coheres with what we've seen in Luke and Matthew. Jesus is not calling his followers to hate their families in terms of how you feel about them emotionally and how you react or even, um, or even take a lead with emotionally. Instead, he's calling for undivided loyalty to himself above family loyalties. I see a parallel here. On Friday, we had a magnificent wedding here with almost 300 guests. 10 bridesmaids, 10 groomsmen, amazing music. And the previous Thursday, we also had a beautiful wedding here held up in the chancel with just 38 guests, beautiful music, and four bridesmaids, or two, I can't quite remember, but it was a lot smaller. Both occasions were deeply moving and deeply meaningful. 
And what happens in a marriage at a wedding service, as I'm sure most of us know, is the bride and groom come from their families and are joined together. In the old traditions, the father of the bride used to give her away. Not something we adhere to these days because of what that implies. But I do remember very clearly on one occasion when I was not able to be a bridesmaid because I was living in Jerusalem and my lovely friend who was getting married therefore refused to have any because I couldn't be there. But she insisted that her father gave her away. She wanted her family to realise that she had to leave them, <laughs> that she had to go and be married to her husband. If you think of it in that context, because after all, Jesus calls us his bride and that he is the bridegroom and that we as the bride of Christ, the church, are given to him. So we leave everything else that we have counted as our environment for growing in, our family, our setting, our life even, and we give ourselves to him. Uh, a little, a little um, um, a memory um, saying was that you would leave your family to cleave to your husband. You would leave your family in order to cleave to your wife. The leaving and the cleaving is right there in Genesis. I think for me that image helps me understand this much more clearly. And I'm sure we all know families where there is heartbreak because a son or a daughter has gone to live elsewhere. I remember, oh, I do know, I had a lovely, lovely friend, still is a very good friend, who had three sons. I lived with them at one time. And she was, they were an amazing family, very close together, all through their childhood, their teens, their 20s. And then two of her sons, all three got married, but two of them got married. One married an American and the other married an Australian. And my poor friend's heart was broken that their sons actually went to America and Australia to live there with their wives. Amazingly, 15 years later, they've both come back and they've both got jobs near where their parents live. So it doesn't mean you have to be devoid of your connections with your family, of course, but it means your allegiance is to your new husband, to your new wife. I hope that helps a little bit in the understanding of the kind of allegiance that Jesus asks from us because that's what he gives to us. It's two-way. A little bit further on in the passage, we read another point about loyalty. Discipleship is defined by following Jesus, our allegiance to him is first, and carrying the cross. And this phrase indicates the giving up of self-interest and competing loyalties. And that giving up is central to discipleship. I'll just say that again so we can think on it for a moment. A giving up of self-interest and competing loyalties. That giving up is central to discipleship, laying things aside. What did Jesus lay aside for us? His home, heaven, his state of being as the word of God because he became human. Neither of these sayings of Jesus lend themselves to be easy on our ears and hearts. It certainly, they certainly don't lend themselves to a low cost form of faith that we could advertise. Instead, they stress the high cost of following Jesus. I wonder if a bride and groom think on their wedding day of the high cost of getting married, of leaving their family. This is not a criticism, it's just to try and put a light on the, high, the kind of high cost we are paying. <clears throat> then there are these two, <clears throat> excuse me, little stories that follow, the parables that illustrate this cost. Um, Jesus suggests two different scenarios. The first envisions a landowner building a tower. We all know about towers, don't we, in our church? Um, either for storing produce or for guarding the land or for animals. That's what towers were used for in those days. If the landowner had not estimated how much the tower will cost, it is possible that the project would remain unfinished due to lack of funds, and the end result will be ridiculed from all those who see the unfinished structure. And the second story, which I've just alluded to vis-a-vis -vis Henry V and William Shakespeare, 
The second story is about a king who assesses the number of his troops in light of the greater number of troops that his enemy is marching towards them. And if he cannot win with the number of soldiers that he has, the only wise course of action will be to negotiate with his enemy long before they meet in battle. So Jesus uses these two stories to illustrate the necessity of counting the cost of discipleship. Jesus extols a commitment to finishing the discipleship journey once begun, not beginning it and then finding that you just want to give up. He says, when you begin this journey, count the cost so that you may finish it. Following Jesus is an all or nothing proposition. The concluding summary makes the connections clear. None of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. That's quite a statement. Sometimes it's quite good to physically walk around, I do, around my house and say, God, this is your sofa. (laughs) These are your pictures. This is your home. As vicars, actually, we are often reminded that it's not our home, or we're often reminded that actually you get a house thrown in with a job. Um, that isn't particularly true. We have to live where we live by, uh, by ecclesiastical law, and we're very grateful for the homes we have. But I know it's not my home. It belongs to diocese. But actually, fundamentally, it's God's home. It's God's place. In this passage... In this passage, Luke has Jesus calling people to a kind of discipleship that is not cheap, not easy, and not to be entered into without deep consideration of the consequences and the costs. If you know the marriage service as I do, you know that at the preface uh, to the marriage service, which is read in full, it's quite long, talks about that marriage should not be entered into lightly but reverently and responsibly. So the passage speaks to us of the importance of loyalty and allegiance to Jesus over all other competing loyalties, including family, self-interest and possessions. While emphases in the earlier part of Luke, excuse me, 14, in the earlier part of Luke 14, there are emphases on redemption and freedom that Jesus has come to save us. And that brings with it the inclusive nature of God's kingdom, that it's for everybody. There is nobody who cannot receive God's gift of life. Jesus has come to include all, and by his sacrifice on the cross has paid the price of sin. It's easy to preach that in many ways. Just to give you two examples for me of being paid for. When I was on my sabbatical a few years ago in California for a short time, I was visiting a church there for part of that time. And after a morning of teaching, they had the most amazing, it was a church of 10,000 people, by the way, had lots of different sites. Um, They had a a wonderful cafe, cafe outlets all around. And I was queuing up to buy coffee and croissant or something and when I came to pay uh, the girl who was at the checkout just said oh no yours has been paid for it's been paid for I said what do you mean she said the man over there has just paid for yours and he's paid for the first 10 people in the line now I went and said thank you to him but if uh, she hadn't pointed him out I wouldn't have known it didn't build a relationship but it was an act of kindness my coffee and my croissant had been paid for Earlier on in my life, when I was working in Jerusalem, I was having um, a a cup of coffee and then we had a supper together with two other friends who we did Pilates. We did Pilates at the YMCA together and we didn't normally have a meal afterwards, but on this occasion we did because two of us worked together. The other friend was there with her, um, just there on her own. (laughs) She was um, Irish and her husband had come to join us. And her husband was the journalist for the equivalent of the Irish Times in Ireland. So he was their correspondent in Jerusalem. And we had a lovely time chatting with him and with her. We had a salad and we had um, 
something to drink, I guess, and then we had an ice cream. And then he had to go. He had to go and file a report. And then she um, went off just before we did. And when my friend Lynn and I came to pay, the waiter said, it's been paid for. He paid for your dinner. And that cemented uh, something of our relationship, an act of kindness. So we know God's kindness, that he pays for us. What we deserve to pay for, he pays for us. That is what salvation is. But salvation in Jesus is not merely a transaction. It's not merely about the kindness of somebody paying for my coffee and then I go off to the next session and then I go on my traveling holiday around California never to see this person again. It's a covenantal covenantal relationship. God said in the Old Testament, I will be your God and you will be my people. In a a marriage, it's a covenant. I will be your husband, you will be my wife. You will be my husband, I will be your wife. That's the covenant that is set up in a marriage contract, if you like, in a marriage ceremony. We have a covenantal relationship with God. And on his part, he redeems us. He pays for us. And on our part, we do nothing to earn that, but we have a response, which is to love completely, to offer our allegiance. To follow Jesus is both a gift and a demand, if you like. Now, we've had a diocesan conference over the last three days. I've had to do mine online for various reasons. And yesterday, I was very moved by some examples of people who follow Jesus in very ordinary life and are in that covenantal relationship. And they're trying to work out in the job they do or at the stage of life they are at, how is it that they can express Jesus' love to other people? There was one person who was quoted to us. I think her name was Vicka, Vicky, and she was a hairdresser. And she felt she had nothing to offer Jesus. She just was a hairdresser, she said. In her church, they prayed for her. And as she went to work, she found herself, whenever she was washing somebody's hair, praying for that person. And she knew that that was her calling, that was her mission as a disciple, to pray for the people whose hair she washed. Now, I know as a female, and I don't know about the rest of the women here, I don't know about the men either, but I, I once, the week before my ordination, I was having my hair cut, and um, the woman who was doing my hair, I was in, a, in Southampton, I just went on spec, it wasn't where I lived, and she just said, my job is just like yours. So I said, what do you mean? And she said, people come and sit here and they pour their hearts out and they tell me the most awful things that's happened to them and then they feel better because I've listened and then they go away again. <laughs> I thought, I think Vicky will find that as a hairdresser. I think she will find that she has a significant discipleship role to play in her work. He spoke of somebody else who was a grandmother in her late 50s to to a young woman, actually, in her early 20s who didn't have any faith, but the grandmother did. And she thought, what, you know, I I don't do anything. My, My grandchildren are not Christians. My children don't even come to church anymore. And then as she talked through what happened whenever her granddaughter came for lunch, her granddaughter came for lunch on a Sunday, I think every week for a while, The granddaughter, being a good granddaughter, as I'm sure all we have been, good grandsons and granddaughters ourselves, said, Granny, what what have you done today? Have you been to church? Yes. Oh, so what what did the vicar talk about today? So the grandmother repeated the sermon. Therefore, you better listen to every word that I say. (laughs) And, you know, eventually, eventually that granddaughter came to faith. That was her calling, the grandmother's calling, to be a grandmother, not to assure her granddaughter, but her allegiance was to Jesus, so she told him her about him, but via what the vicar had said. So it's kind of third party, which is helpful, like telling the contents of a book. And then he talked about somebody who was 93, who said, I cannot get around really and truly. I don't see anybody. How is my discipleship 
working out. And they worked out that she did go to the corner shop from time to time. And that in the corner shop, she would chat to people who were there, chat to the owner. And they pointed out to her that Christ is in her. And that as you go and talk to other people, even in your little local corner shop, you are being Christ to them. And she suddenly had a new vibrancy in her faith and was praying for her corner shop. Whenever she could get there, she was able to shine the light of Christ. Our allegiance to Christ is that he should be first. And I think those three examples help us to see in our own, in my own everyday life, we are able to offer him our allegiance first and foremost, just where we are. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of life that you give us. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to put our trust completely in you. But just where we are, you call us to be your disciples and that our loyalty is to you. And when we see that, Lord, we see your love poured out upon all those whom we love. Give us your grace, Lord. Give us your word. Give us your joy. Amen. Let's stand to say the creed together. We say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you like to sit on, Neil, as we come to our intercessions? As we pray for the church and the world, let us first thank God for the power of his love, which continually surrounds us wherever we are. Loving Father, help us to clear space in our lives where your holy presence may grow and produce fruit worthy of our great calling. Plant seeds of joy and peace that love might grow and be shown as we live in harmony with others. Lord, may we respond by faith to what we hear and use our mouths to share who you are. May we tell of your good deeds and love and inspire faith in those around us. Help us to have compassion for those in need and respond in love with acts of generosity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we bring you a world torn by division and suffering. We ask that international leaders may know wisdom, courage, and strength in responding to the unfolding situations. We pray for all who are experiencing the terror of war and conflict, particularly those who are forced to flee their homes in fear. May God grant that they find open doors, 
minds and hearts, wherever they seek shelter and peace. We remember especially the people of Ukraine that in this time of fear and destruction, they may know God's presence and peace. We pray for an end to hostilities, especially the deadly attacks on civilians sheltering in basements, hospitals, schools, and traveling to safety. Please raise up on both sides those who desire to find ways to save lives and establish justice and truth. We also pray especially for the people of Afghanistan now struggling once more under the rule of the Taliban. Give them the strength to defend themselves against their oppressors and may those who manage to escape find refuge and compassion wherever they seek it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this time of obvious and extreme climate change, we pray for the wisdom and strength to do everything we can to protect your wonderful natural world. So we pray for all those affected by the floods in Pakistan, for those who've died, the grieving, and those whose homes and land have been destroyed. May the people of Pakistan receive the practical support they need to rebuild their lives and communities. May those involved in rescue and recovery have the strength and the courage to continue their extraordinary work for as long as it is needed. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we bring to you our own troubled country with its need for honorable and compassionate leadership. May Her Majesty the Queen be granted continued wisdom and strength. May the new Prime Minister and the Cabinet they appoint restore integrity to politics. And as we face the certainty of soaring fuel bills, rising food prices and industrial unrest, may they resolve to tackle the country's problems in a spirit of truth, cooperation and compassion. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Loving Father, we pray for our local community leaders in Croydon as they attempt to deal with homelessness and violence. We bring before you the emergency services, the medical and care professionals, and all those who continue to work and volunteer in those vital frontline services on which we all depend. Father, we pray for our church family, for our church leaders and all who give unsparingly of their time and efforts to ensure that the ministry continues through personal contact where possible and through the wonders of technology where necessary. Thinking about the families who've lost loved ones or who are currently in pain, mental or physical, let us take a moment in silence to remember those who are named in the notice sheet or who for whatever reason are on our hearts this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we bring you before you this morning the children and young people of our parish, whose education and well-being have suffered through illness and isolation. As they start the first term of this new academic year, may they and their teachers enjoy a more normal educational experience with all of its excitement, pleasures, and challenges. Uh, thinking of the young people, I came across this short inspirational quotation from Nelson Mandela. I hadn't heard it before. He was addressing young people in 2005, but I think it could be particularly applicable to our current youngsters, who goodness knows have quite a job on their hands. So you might want to give them this word of encouragement. Sometimes it falls on a generation to be great. You can be that great generation. Let your greatness blossom. Amen. Heavenly Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Shall we stand together to share the peace?
When Jesus came and stood amongst his disciples, he said to them, peace be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. We share a sign of that peace with one another now. And as we come to prepare ourselves to receive communion, we're going to sing the song Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. And during this song, we will receive our offerings if you place them in the plate. here his spirit is with us lift up your hearts we lift them to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give thanks and praise it is right to praise you father Lord of all creation in your love you made us for yourself when we turned away you did not reject us but came to meet us in your son you embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. 
saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Would you like to sit or kneel as we pray together as our Saviour taught us? We pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You are welcome to come and receive bread and wine here if you're visiting us, and that's what you do in your church, you're welcome here. If you'd rather come and receive a blessing, come with everybody else, but keep your hands by your sides. It's Regina here.
We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just a few notices, one of which we're just going to watch a very short video to illustrate. The 18th of September is Back to Church Sunday. We've not particularly marked it before in this church, but I thought we might do so this year. And what that means is we're going to send out invitations to all sorts of people who you may know some, you may not know them all, but who've been part of our church family or have been married here or baptised here over the years and invite them to come to that particular service. I wonder, Chris, if you could just play the short video describing. I think The Bishop of Manchester hopes that this welcome pack will persuade more people to take a pew. While the novel campaign comes as congregations continue to dwindle, there's even chocolate in there. The Bishop of Manchester wants us all marching into a church near you. There's quite a lot of low morale around the country about church going, uh, quite a lot of myths that aren't true. And we know that there are churches which can be alive, can be vibrant, can be full, because we've got some in this diocese. Ten years ago, Back to Church Sunday set out to answer one very important question. We're completely aware that uh, spirituality isn't dead that uh, many, many people have a, a sort of hunger for God, but they're not coming to church, and we want to find out why and do something about that. So began a radically simple new approach to evangelism. Cheryl Evans, who I've known since I moved into the village, uh, came and knocked on the door and said, I want to invite you to back to church Sunday. And so we said, Cheryl, because it's you, we'll come. So after a decade of invitation... Hello. Hello. What's next? for Back to Church Sunday. So here we are with the Back to Church season of invitation and the secrets in the name. Invitation, that's the particular moment that the Back to Church movement has tried to focus on. That moment when you turn to your friend, you say, would you like to, would you mind, why not come to church with me and see what makes me tick? Canterbury were really keen to do the season of invitation because we've been involved in Back to Church Sunday for quite a few years with a lot of success. People really loved it. And taking part in the season of invitation seemed an opportunity just to move it on, to see whether if you invite someone more than once, whether that makes a difference. And, um, and the results were really good. So the season of invitation means five opportunities every year to welcome people back to church. The reason we're moving from just one Back to Church Sunday to a season of invitation is that research has shown us that people need to be asked a few times because they may be nervous, the person who's asking may be nervous. If we have a season of invitation, Christians will become more confident to invite and the people they invite will come more often. And who knows, they may stick with the faith, come to know Christ as their Lord and the church will grow. So we're moving from back to church Sunday through Harvest Remembrance, Christmas time to actually offer that opportunity for folks to say, hey, there's a lot going on at our church, just come with me, please. I think for me, invitation is absolutely the key. You can have all the resources and the great ideas and a church can put on a magnificent service, but unless there's the personal, caring, friendly invitation and welcome, then the connection's not gonna be made at all. First, pray, ask, God to give you the opportunity to suggest to someone that they might come to church with you. Secondly, ask them along. It's that simple. And you'll be astonished at what God does. Invite your friends to church on these five moments in this particular part of the year and we believe it will make a big difference. Share your faith with them with confidence. Invite them to come to the church you love and the church will grow.
You might have recognised John Kiddle, who's one of the archdeacons in Southwark Diocese, so this video was made at least six years ago. <laughs> but as you know, we are quite invitational here for Harvest and for Remembrance Sunday and for Christmas and for Pentecost. So this is just taking it, it's just highlighting it a little bit more by adding in another opportunity for us to invite friends and contacts we have. But they will be available for you next Sunday, two invitations each to take that you might like just to hand to somebody or put it through their door with a note saying, would you like to come with me next Sunday? And of course, harvest is the week after, so you've got an easy follow-up. If they can't come on back to church Sunday on the 18th, then harvest is another lovely opportunity to invite people to come back and or to come for the first time even. And on both occasions, we'll have um, something to offer afterwards. We always have tea and coffee, but I think we're going to have cake on the 18th, and then we're going to have a soup, bread and cheese on the, at, uh, on the Harvest Festival Sunday. So look out for a couple of invitations for each of you to take with you next Sunday and do be praying about who you might give them to and pray for the invitations that we send out centrally from here to all our contacts and all those that we perhaps haven't seen for quite a while. I think the notice sheet is always pretty self-explanatory. Um, we've got a our last Alpha meeting this coming Monday and standing committee on Tuesday and confirmation begins for our teenagers on Wednesday. So please do be praying for all of those um, meetings. They're fundamental to people's lives and to the life of our whole church family. And then Messy Church is on September the 18th. So thank you for praying about that. Thank you to those of you who have offered um, you may find that Val will approach one or two more people. What we don't want anyone to feel is that they have to come every single month to Messy Church. But I think once you do come, it's quite, uh, it's quite fun. So you want to come back again. But we'd like it to broaden the, um, the breadth of our team. And so if Val has a word with you about it, don't feel you're being pressurised, but just see if there's something you can do to assist. But we've had a couple of people volunteer, which is really good news. So do keep praying for that um, time of worship, which is a really good, um, a good focus for outreach. So let's stand and sing our last hymn, which is... I haven't got my sheet in front of me. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's stand and sing together.
The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.